let me welcome Janet here. She's uh, a long friend from one of those first conferences I was speaking and she happened to be there. And from that time on, I don't think we've seen each other that often until like recently, we happened to speak at the same conference and I'm not sure if it was the Japan or India, but it was somewhere in Asia and I see her name and my name as one of the only names I knew. And I was like, hey, I have brought her. So that's why she's here because we met at another conference. So, yes, for you. So it's all mine now, huh? Okay, so I will share my screen. There we go. And let's see if I can make sure I have the chat up as well, because that's always a good thing to have. Okay. Um, it was at the Japanese uh, Scrum, regional scum, Scrum gathering. That's where we met again. That's right. I was speaking at two gatherings that week, so it's sort of mixing those two together, or that month, uh, India and uh, and Japan. Yeah. All right. But Japan yeah. is great. <laughs> All right. So, welcome everybody. Um, Friday, Friday morning for me. Um, Friday afternoon for some of you, and maybe even evening for others. Today I'm going to talk about um, quality because that's a, a passion of mine um, and quality from a process perspective, but also from a product perspective. So a little bit about me just to give you context. I started off as a programmer. Um, I got, uh, I don't know, promoted, I guess would be a good word for it, to a QA manager. Uh, but then I had the opportunity to be on an agile team as a tester. And since that time on, and that was about 2000, uh, I've been a tester, a, a QA lead, um, all kinds of different roles, sometimes coach, sometimes both, um, consultant, coach, different things. Sometimes, um, yeah, all of that doesn't matter, but always focusing on testing and quality practices within an agile development. Uh, and it's been for 20 years now, which is a long time. Uh, written a couple of books, co-authored with Lisa Crispin, um, started the Agile Testing Fellowship, which is a community for agile testers uh, and anybody else who cares about quality. So enough about me. I like quotes. Um, and this is one of my uh, favorites from Edward Deming. It's from 1982 uh, when he identified his uh, key principles for business effectiveness. I think that those principles are still alive and well, um, and they're very effective even in agile teams. So they're very old, but they still exist. Uh, the only issue I have with this particular quote, because I do believe quality is everybody's responsibility, is the idea of improving productivity. And that is, because people want to measure it and it's so uh, misunderstood. But other than that, I really like the quote. The second quote is one of mine. Um, one of the problems that I see with companies when they transition to agile is they concentrate on the idea of speed. And when they do that, they forget about the quality and then they have to work really hard to get that back in again. This talk is, is based on and changed over the last years, um, but it's based on a four part series that I did a few months ago. Um, I put in the form of blog posts. Uh, been thinking a lot about the relationship between development, uh, that includes testing by the way, and how we manage the quality of our products. I find these two things get confused very often. Um, but there's a relationship between them, between testing and quality, but they are not the same. So I'm going to start this by talking a little bit about quality. 
And then I'll talk a little bit about testing and how it supports a quality conversation. And the last thing I'll bring in is how can we, or should we, or do we measure quality, but how that can also change our conversation. So I see somebody said, are you seeing part of the PowerPoint presenter? Ah, yes, I will move that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention on the chat. Got to watch the chat. So quality, it's hard to describe. It's um, having that conversation about quality is hard. So I'm gonna use an example I find uh, people can relate to, uh, coffee. If you don't like coffee, think tea. I did tea in Japan, right? Um, or maybe you think beer, I don't care. All the same idea. So I want you to think about which coffee is best, one, two, or three. Put it into the chat so I can kind of see what people think. Do you like one, two, or three? So a lot of threes, everybody wants three. Ah, somebody judges on taste, so they can't tell. Somebody likes one, two. So the majority of the people like three, but we do have some that will take one and two. And at least one person who is reserving judgment. Now, I personally would choose one because I like my coffee plain and black. Um, <clears throat> I care about the taste a little bit, but mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly it's, it's about, I need caffeine in the morning. So just give me a cup of coffee um, or two. But when you made your judgment, did you think about the coffee at all? Did you think about the beans? Did you think about where it came from, how it was roasted? Um, what was it that you chose on? The pretty design? Is that why people chose three versus two? I don't know. So it's uh, people want, they choose on different things. Now, if I put a price beside it, this is a different dimension. Would this change what you buy? Because, you know, you pay a lot of dollars, an extra dollar and 50 cents for the pretty design on top. Is it worth it to you? Or do you assume because it's more expensive, it is better, right? What about the service? Maybe the environment where it was served. Maybe you like a particular coffee shop better than another one. Or maybe you get um, a quick cup of coffee at a gas station or an upscale cafe that might take longer. Depending on how you look at it will depend on how you perceive quality. So it's not easy to look at. Now, when we think about definitions of quality, the most popular definition I hear is the one from Jerry Weinberg. Quality is value to some person. I like it. It's simple, but I think it might be too simplistic and understate some of the dimensions we should be thinking about. In the last few years, Brent Jensen and Alan Page have been talking about their modern testing principles. And their fifth principle is, we believe that the customer is the only one capable of judging and evaluating the quality of our product. Like Jerry's, it's a simplistic quality model. And defining quality is hard. And maybe it's not something we can do with one sentence. So when we look at it, and if we start to look at it from different perspectives, I think maybe the meaning changes a little bit. 
So from a customer perspective, uh, sometimes we don't even know who our real customers are, but do we know how they use our product? For example, um, uh, coffee shops, some of those coffee shops are very specific. They know who their customers are and they cater to them, right? But we, and we can use personas to try to think about that. But what about other stakeholders? Because there is a lot of other stakeholders in any product we build. If we think of the process, that's how we create our product. How do we code it? How do we test it? How do we define it? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. The product, the product value. So think about the coffee. How much are you willing to pay for specific features or the ambiance or the perceived quality of the product? Um, maybe you pay more and you're willing to pay more for organic or true or uh, fruit good trade practices, right? It becomes a personal thing. Uh, price, maybe the stakeholders is the company. Do they charge enough to make a profit or maybe they depend on volume So versus price. So think if you're thinking watches, Rolex versus Omega. Rolex actually doesn't think about volume so much. They're doing on price and, and perception. I was looking at smart watches the other day because I need a new one. Mine's not working as well as I wanted to. And I was trying to compare features with the dollars, right? I also looked at reviews from different people and different customers and from articles, but I still found it really hard to judge. One of the reasons was because I was also looking at appearance, which really has nothing to do with quality, but everything to do with my own ego, right? I want a pretty watch. I don't want the watch band or the watch face to be too big. I have small wrists and some of them are just too big. So lots of different perceptions, perceptives. There's also lots of quality attributes and many of these are implicit when our customers buy our products. Um, we need to make sure those work. For example, the smartwatch I was looking at Battery life was something that is important to me. Often the, the highest risks are our biggest constraints. And that makes testing and addressing those risks, uh, those quality attributes even more important. So maybe we should start our conversation with risks instead of something else. Um, for example, if uh, a friend of mine a while ago had a pacemaker installed, right? So medical devices like pacemakers or anything else, uh, they need to be working 100% of the time. We're not going to just install it and say, let's hope it works, right? We expect that. We expect that it's safe for us to, to use. Another example might be data integrity. We carry a lot of data with us these days in our smartphones, in our credit cards. Some of us trust that a little bit more than others, but it is what it is. We are plugged in to the world um, through the internet of things. My smartwatch is a good example, right? We trust that it works. Um, we trust, for example, that Alexa isn't sharing our most private moments with the rest of the world. Or when I use my smartphone to turn up the heat in the house when I've been away, that it won't accidentally unlock my front door. We expect safety. So let's look at those attributes just a little bit closer. Uh, I've categorized some of them into the the most popular attributes into three categories. Um, now, none of these attributes cover specific features or functionality. We do need to make sure they work, but quite often we stop at testing functionality and don't think about these other attributes. Um, so 
sometimes we consider those ones that I put in the operational and stop because we think about performance. We think about reliability, maybe security. But if we start to think about quality um, attributes as constraints on the system, consider them with every feature we build, with every single story, even down to the task level, that's when we can start building quality into our system and we can start testing for it. So if we look at those attributes in the deployment environment, right? Thinking about recoverability, how are we gonna recover? How are we going to be able to retrieve that? We have to start thinking about persistence or maybe hot backups or lots of other things. How do we make sure that the data stays private? How do we ensure that it doesn't get you know, uh, taken? Do we encrypt it in our database? We have to be thinking about this as we build. Even the development environment attributes. So this is at the coding level, right? Are we making our code testable so that we can do that? Are we building in uh, it for ease of use to modify or to change? When we start thinking about things like security, do we know how to build security into our code? We need to be thinking about it at every step of the way. If we go back to my smartwatch, maybe, I, well, I do, I want it to work no matter what I am doing, jogging, not that I jog, but um, I want it to be able to work when I'm gardening, when I'm pounding nails into my deck, right? It needs to be robust. You cannot put that in after. You have to think about it when you're selecting the materials, um, when you're doing the inner workings of the watch, you cannot wait to the end to test it. It needs to be built in. So let's talk a little bit more about testing. I said before um, that testing was a process activity, but part of testing is understanding the risks. And that means looking at the product and understanding the big picture. Many people say that testers have a different mindset from others. Um, for example, programmers, others in the delivery team. I'm not sure that that's correct, but you know, as a tester, we do have a tendency to question everything. It drives my husband crazy, but we look at things with a critical mindset. Others can learn to do that, but maybe testing is about people because it's important to think about the people. Maybe it's a bit of all three, product, process, and the people. So this is a definition I took on testing. Now, this particular definition probably is more suited to something like vaccines, right? Testing vaccines. If we look at the definition of software testing, a set of processes aimed at investigating, okay, evaluating, okay, and ascertaining the completeness of the quality. I'm not too sure about that ascertaining, but definitely investigating and evaluating. But it's quite narrow in some places, but really quite vague. So let's look at a little bit closer. Now, this is a definition of testing according to me. So it's got to be true. No, just kidding. Everybody needs to think about what it means for them. So I think testing provides feedback in many different forms. Um, finding bugs is one way. Identifying hidden assumptions. And we all make assumptions based on our own internal biases, based on our own perceptions. Um, this always reminds me of a story. Quite a few years ago, uh, we were on a vacation with my, my children and grandchildren. And my grandson was about five at the time. 
And he was out on the balcony. We were in Hawaii and he was out on the balcony and he said, daddy, come here, look, the cars are driving on the water. And so my son-in-law went out on the balcony and he goes, no, Braden, they're not. They're driving on the bridge. And, and Braden says, no, they're on the waters. I can see them. And this went on back and forth for a little while. And then my granddaughter went out on the, on the balcony and she looks, she was about seven. And she says, daddy, squat down here. So my son-in-law squats and she says, look, Braden sees the cars driving on the water. And sure enough, it looked like they were driving on the water. And then she said, now stand up and pick up Braden. So he did. And she said, see Braden, they look like they're on the water, but they're actually on the bridge. It was about their perspective. And it took somebody else, a seven-year-old, to come in and show them their perspectives, to talk about those different perspectives. What assumptions do we have? And testing helps do that. Um, we want to be thinking about it. It gives state information about the state of the product. This is the evaluation, right? Um, we can think about risks and identifying those risks. Uh, I was listening to a, a YouTube video about testing while I was doing something else. My husband watches them all the time and Sundays is one of his favorites. Uh, this particular one was from a fellow in Denmark. Uh, he's a programmer by trade and he's fixing his sailboat up and YouTube videoing it. But he had installed something new and he wanted to test it. The documentation didn't show how. He did some reading, he asked other sailing people, and they all said, why are you testing that? It should just work, install it, use it. But he evaluated the risk and said, uh, not so much. It was too high a risk. So as it turns out, he figured out a way to test it. And there was something not right. So what is the risk? identify it, figure out a way to mitigate it. Because for him, being out on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean, too high a risk if it didn't work. We can assess quality by testing, but only if we know what quality we're testing for. What is the level? So we test, we can tell the testing story We've tested this, this is what we found, right? Now, just a final note, testing does not assure or ensure quality as indicated by that previous slide definition, right? We can only give information about what is known um, and the risks associated with it, right? If I um, say I found a bug, there's no way that I can make the team fix it unless it's a, they want to, right? We cannot assure or ensure quality by testing. So there's a lot of different activities associated with testing. Um, the Agile Testing Quadrants, and I'm not gonna go into detail. You can look them up all you want, but there's, it's a model to help talk about testing activities. Um, and the types in here are just um, examples, right? They, the examples will change. For example, <clears throat> the top right hand. In the last year, we added the idea of monitoring and observability because we have more of that now. So the left hand side is about tests we do to help guide development. We are trying to prevent defects in our code. So things like um, identifying those hidden assumptions, testing ideas. The right-hand side is critiquing the product, evaluating. I have it in my hand. I can hold it. I can touch it. I can feel it. I can whatever to it. We are finding defects. But we want fast feedback all the time. 
The top half is business facing tests, the tests that the business cares about and may want to read. So we might want to make them in a business readable language. The bottom half is technology facing, which just says the tests are um, important. Business probably cares about the results, but they would never go look at them. For example, a load test, they care about the results, but they'd never go actually look and try to read the tests. And, and so we really want to think about all these different testing types. Um, the quality attributes that I talked a little bit before are in that bottom right hand quadrant, right? They're technology facing tests that critique the product. These ones are the ones that get forgotten quite often. And they often help define the quality of our product. So let's talk about it a little bit more and let's go into our process. Uh, I wrote a blog post a long time ago about why I hate the terms shift left and shift right. But I hate it when it's applied to a linear line and that's how people think of it. But development isn't linear. It's a, I think it's a real mistake to think about it that way. I like the idea of an infinity loop. I saw, first saw it in um, Ellen Godestiner and Mary Gorman's Discovered to Deliver book. And, and then later in the DevOps loop. And finally in Dan Ashby's continuous testing model, we test everywhere. And that's kind of the model that um, inspired this one. Uh, if we think about left and right halves of the loop, right? Moving constantly from one to the other, sometimes flowing quickly, other times more slowly. Um, sometimes we even have to stop and go back where we started. For example, if a smoke test failed, right? We deploy it, run a smoke test, it failed. We would have to go back to building. We wouldn't complete the loop. So we wanna be thinking about this um, and if we look a little closer at it, right? So the beginning, I know an infinity loop doesn't have a beginning or an end, but uh, we'll start where we think of the beginning, the start of an idea, right? So we're going to brainstorm. We're gonna think about that, um, testing ideas. These are the testing activities that are early in the cycle. Right? They're about preventing defects um, in the code. They are about getting shared understanding of why and what we are building. Uh, we can, this is where we can start having those quality discussions about our risks, right? We know what quality attributes then we need to consider as constraints. We can um, discover and test ideas highlight those hidden assumptions. We might even do user experience type testing with real customers. But this is where we start to ask those questions on the quality attributes. For example, uh, do we need to think about the diversity of who is using our product? Is that going to make a huge difference? Are we building in limitations without realizing it? For example, my smartwatch. If every face of every watch was built for a man's hand, I would never buy one because it would be too big for my wrist. This is how we start building quality into the product. As long as we're building the right thing and understand the problem space, we get a better chance of getting it right. These tests are that top left part of those quadrants, quadrant two. When we go into during development, right? Um, this is during your iteration or story development. Not all people think of these things like uh, code analysis as testing activities, but in my opinion, they are. Um, most of these are about process quality. How well are they performing? How well are we performing as a team? They help us to feel confident, like test-driven development, that we are not introducing coding level bugs. 
Only two of these really talk about product quality. Um, if you're using personas, for example, and you're thinking about the end user, maybe some of our exploratory testing, we might be considering the product as a whole. User acceptance testing, if you do that, um, that's getting the real users in early to give us feedback. Uh, this is a way of addressing product quality as well. Is it meeting the needs of the end user? The rest, it's all about how do we build it? And we do need both, we do. The right-hand side of the loop, this is uh, getting into the deployment pipeline. Uh, when we're thinking about um, continuous delivery, right? Uh, automated fast feedback, being able to deploy quickly. This gives us real feedback from watching customer actions, uh, reactions, monitoring events, observing. It's a different type of testing. Now, the key to this is that analyzing and learning. We need to get that, we need to think about. And then it feeds back in to that left side of the loop. So there's lots of different testing activities um, with built-in loops. And, and those feedback loops, those are important, right? Um, because that gives us the information to help accept, access, assess quality. Um, and it's important. If we're not measuring, how do we know? <clears throat> I see there's a question in the chat and I'll answer them as, right after the presentation. So measuring, how do we measure our testing efforts? How do we measure our product quality? They're both really, really hard questions. So I want you to think about what you measure And in, oops, sorry, in the chat, oops, I went too far. Uh, in the chat, I want you to think about what do you measure and write in what you measure in your team. Take a couple of minutes here. What kinds of things do your team measure about quality? Okay, sometimes no more than meeting acceptance criteria and a story, number of bugs after releases, performance, SLA, service level agreements, bugs in production. So SLAs will depend on the, on the team and the product. Customer requirements, measuring cycle time, customer confidence, definition of done, time taken to solve, so cycle time. Transactions per second. All right. So some of these are, are things that I've got in here too, in my list. Different teams measure different things, right? Um, now, if you measure the number of bugs in, in within the team or the severity of bugs, it might tell me how bad the quality is, even if I measure the trend and not the actual numbers. Um, 
the somebody said um, on in the chat. Just gonna go back here up here. Look, customer confidence. How do you measure customer confidence? Right. That is a uh, perhaps by surveys. Right. Sometimes if you build in um, specific measures, maybe, but it's hard to do that. Now, this list that I have on the screen, none of these measure product quality. They're all process quality measures, right? Um, how well are we building it? And we measure these things because they're easier to measure. Um, we can ask our customers, uh, but you have to be kind of fairly specific about what it is you want to get it. So we measure the easy things, the process quality. The state of DevOps has some great measures for process quality, right? Um, and it's a good thing, but the product quality is much harder, even asking the customer. Now, the one kind of thing about measures, if it becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So for example, if I'm using um, unit test coverage and we say we have to have, I don't know, a ridiculous amount, 95% unit test coverage. That becomes a target and people quit thinking about it in a different way. They're not trying to get good unit tests, they're just trying to get as many as they possibly can. And they're not always good. So measuring is hard and, and understanding what you wanna measure. Now, if we look at product quality, Isabel Evans showed me this graph um, a while ago. These are two different products. They have the same uh, kind of functionality, right? However, they were aimed at two completely different sets of users. One set did not care about speed, but they were scared of making mistakes because they weren't tech savvy. The other group valued being able to do things quickly and wanted the flexibility. This was aimed at people who are legally blind. So the, the difference was not a price point, but an attribute difference, right? They were competitors, but not really, since they had a different customer base. So their quality was both based on value and user-based um, metrics, right? Um, so they needed to know and understand their customers, their personas, both provided value to the customer they were targeting, right? So we go back to the coffee, the um, customers, some are willing to spend $5 for that great cappuccino and others, not so much. Some of us don't even like cappuccino that much, right? Do you know, and this is a question for you to think about, take away, do you know where your product stands? Do you know what you're targeting? Do you know what you're basing your quality on? Um, perhaps you're uh, working with a utility company that it doesn't matter what you do because the consumers will likely stick it out. And in your case, it's okay, but most of us are not. So let's kind of wrap this up and then we have some time for Q&A. No right answer, right? Um, it's important you have that quality discussion. So maybe you can start it with having a discussion around quality attributes. So I got this idea from Margaret Deneen, but start with your quality attributes, the ones you think might be important or maybe all of them, a big list. Start with your team choose a range uh, in this one. I've just got one to 10, 10 being this is the highest priority, one being the lowest priority. Find out what everybody on your team thinks and then have a conversation. Then spread it up. Let other people in. Ask another team on your product. Do they all have the same idea? Having the same understanding of what quality is for your organization and your product is important. That conversation is important. 
And as a collaborative high-performing team, we need to be able to think about our customers and their expectations, right? It is not enough to make sure the product works. It needs to satisfy all the needs of the customers and we need to know how that means. So if you're not talking about quality yet, uh, you have the opportunity to start. Maybe start with some of those attributes in your team. So if you don't have that conversation about risk, about attributes, how will you ever know what testing needs to be done? How will you ever know what risks to even consider? So yes, quality is everybody's responsibility. So Edward Deming says, truly believe it. But that also means that testing activities that help support that quality are everyone's responsibility as well. So point number two, cannot assure quality. I can point out a defect, tree on the road, but if the defect is not chosen to get fixed, you get a workaround. So please don't be one of those teams that say, I tested, I reported, um, and paint around the tree, right? We need to think about how we fix it. So um, I love this statement. Uh, the nature of quality is complex and diverse. I heard it somewhere, but I cannot remember where I heard it, um, but I'd love to give somebody the credit for that. It's not me, uh, but it's so true, right? And as a last statement, really understand what you mean and what your team means, what your product means, what your organization means when you say quality. And with that, I am going to um, kind of just leave it. Um, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out on Twitter or my email. Um, I answer emails, I do. And the references will all be on the recording. I'm assuming it's being recorded. Yes, okay. So these references will all be on there as well. And with that, I will stop sharing and we'll go back to the Q&A section. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and ask. In the meantime, I'll start asking, right? Or you can write it to the chat as well. And what stuck with me, you know, I'm a former developer. I didn't code for a long time, but uh, I hear a lot of from remembering myself as well, but from my colleagues as well, all mm -hmm. those years now, like you said, uh, testing is everybody's responsibility. I keep saying that as well now, but I still remember a time where I was like saying, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so what do you do with those people like who are like, completely like, no, 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 I don't do testing because, you know? Yeah, you know, I think I, I was um, very lucky because my very first job that I had out of university, I was a mature student, but my very first job was working with the stock exchange company. And so it was a very critical application, but every morning I come in, I was a programmer. So every morning I'd come in and my supervisor would sit with me and say, so Janet, what are you working on today? So I'd explain and he'd say, so how are you gonna test that? At the end of the day, he'd come back and he'd say, sit with me and he goes, so Janet, show me how you tested that. And this was our conversation for months until he got believed that I could actually do it. We didn't have testers. So I, I, I grew up as a programmer who cared about testing, um, which is why I, when I moved to my next company, I was made QA manager because I was on, the only programmer who cared about quality and testing. <laughs> um, but I think that if you are on a team, and you talk about it. And, and if you're on an agile team, especially that even if you have a tester on a team and not all teams are able to, to get good testers, that tester can't do it all. So as a team, we have to start taking responsibility. And I see 
um, fewer and fewer of those types of programmers. As long as you think that the tester, and as long as the tester thinks, um, because there's still a lot of testers that think I am responsible for quality. I am responsible for all the testing. Nobody else can do it as good as me. Once you let go of that ego and start talking about it and start seeing the differences in the quality of the product, less bugs, right? Programmers don't like to fix bugs. If they see fewer bugs, it's much easier to buy into it, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. That's why I like the automated testing, right? But still in some companies where they don't have it, it's like super hard to start. So what do you have as a hint for those organizations who have like zero automation and then yeah. they have a huge product up and running with of course bugs there? Yeah. Right? So what so, yes. Yeah. So one of the things is I, I I'll say start now, start with the next story, right? Start with your biggest pain points, um, but just start. If you keep putting it off, your, your system's just gonna get bigger and bigger. I tell a story and it's not my story. It's Lisa Crispin's story. But um, she went into a, a company one time and they had no automated tests. And so she was doing what she thought was the right thing at the time. This is quite a few years ago. And so she said, we have to do our regression test before the end of the sprint because we cannot, um, it won't be pop, you know, potentially shippable. And she realized that she could not do that herself, it just didn't work. So she took it back to the team and the team of course, really wanted to do good work. They, they were, uh, which always helps. But she said, I can't do this myself. How are we going to address this regression test problem? So the team decided to stop their iteration a day early and the whole team, including the programmers, including the scrum master, including the product owner, all chipped in to do the regression testing, every iteration. It, uh, the very next iteration, there were stories to start automation because nobody likes doing that stuff. So share the pain, right? Mm -hmm. Share the pain. That's how you start. It's interesting. I remember when they actually asked us to do this uh, testing every now and then, they always bought us a donuts. So they <laughs> make it less painful for us. So we actually want to go there and test. We still yeah. do. But, uh... so, so, so that's a, a, from Mary Lynn and Linda Rising's book, um, uh patterns for change no yeah for name just skip but bring food yeah right bring food, right <laughs> yeah bring food they will come yeah so somebody on the chat earlier said um if you if you define your quality too high right if you start to test too much and it's kind of the question that says how much is too much when do you stop what's good enough um, because you don't want to do gold plating, right? So it comes back to those early conversations. What is the purpose? Why are we doing this? And, and having an acceptance test that says, you know, this is what, the, what we're trying to accomplish. And then looking at examples early, trying to understand what the purpose of this particular story is that gives the team a much better understanding of what's important. Um, and when the whole team is responsible, I find that, um, that there's more conversation about how much is enough. Is this good enough? It's not only my responsibility, so I don't have to test absolutely everything because I have more people sharing this with me. And, I find that that makes a huge difference um, it, having those conversations with the team. It's all about conversations at the end oh, of the time, right? Yeah, conversations, collaboration, yeah. for sure. 
What was your uh, biggest shift, right? You started uh, at a college, et cetera, that you've been working with different organizations. So what, what do you remember as sort of the most interesting shift? Well, I tell this story and it's, it's with a little bit of head hanging low story. But when I was uh, made QA manager in that one organization, I left it, it was not a good organization. It just wasn't a good place for me. But one, I had a, a manager who was constantly uh, giving me articles to read and different things. But one day he walked into my office and this was not agile, by the way, this was not an agile project, um, but it was a very toxic, uh, lots of adverse um, adversarial between testers and programmers. Uh, but he walked into my office one day and he said, so Janet, I think you should start giving your test to the programmers first. And I went, are you crazy? Why would we do that? And I look back on that particular moment and I just want to kind of go hit my head against a wall thinking how stupid was I, right? Um, so that particular shift when I started as a tester on an agile team, which was like the very next year, I often, think if I had responded differently to him, what might have changed? I don't think it would have changed the environment, but that particular shift in my own thinking um, took me in a whole new direction. Uh, and I was really grateful for that. Sometimes you have to leave to find out what to go forward, right? But to me, that was a huge shift in the way I was thinking. Uh, and it was just because I had become um, adjusted, for lack of a better word, to the environment that I was in, that there's no way I would have given the developers my tests. And now I just sit there and I go, well, that's kind of the silliest thing I ever heard. Of course I want to give them. Mm -hmm. Of course I want to give them. It helps everybody. Right, our time is almost over, but I've seen Oleg yes. raising his head. So, Oleg, your turn. Last question. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, like, what you are saying is too many testers actually hurt. Is this what you are saying? The project you, or the environment? So, can you ask that again? Like, from what you are saying, I, I did use that too many testers on the project actually hurt because then uh, developers start to be lazy. Sometimes, yes. So if I'm, if, if I'm working with a team, for example, I was working with a team um, just a, a, a month or two ago and they had equal number of programmers and testers on the team, which I haven't seen for a very long time. But um, they were trying to make the shift. They had no automation. Um, and they were trying to make the shift, trying to figure out how to work together. Eventually, if the programmers start to take some of that, that, um, that work, you can have fewer testers. But if you have testers that still want to work really closely with the developers, and these testers were, they were learning how, but the system was so big and there were so many business rules that the programmers couldn't keep it all in their head. They couldn't keep uh, that big picture. So the testers were actually providing real value. So, but they weren't, they weren't taking ownership of the quality. Um, that's where it can become a problem. If the testers say, it is my, right? Or the programmers, throw it over the wall and don't take responsibility. That's where the problem comes in, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so and what, what is the ratio then? Do you have a number? Nope. nope. My very first Agile team, I was the only tester with about 10 to 12 programmers. So I was very much a test uh, consultant working with the programmers and they were writing the tests and running the tests. And I was just helping uh, review results and, and things like that, right? There is no good number. It depends on your product, right? And your team, depends a lot on the team. Mm 